Okay. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, as the last speaker now of this quantum sensor session. And I'm going to talk a particular quantum sensor here, namely atom interferometry, and in particular large scale atom interferometry to explore fundamental physics goals. Um, before I come to that, I think it is a prudent approach to give a very short introduction to this quantum sensor, which is a relatively special quantum sensor. And as I'm not really coming out of the field historically of cold atoms, I always have tried to find an analogy which I'm familiar with. And the best analogy you can have for atom interferometry, I think, is laser interferometry. That's something we're actually teaching to our students at university. So most physicists are being familiar with. And in laser interferometry, obviously, the active element is laser light which you shine on a beam splitter then you basically have the two different paths which are opening for the laser light and you reconnect them with mirrors then in a detection system and what you are measuring then are the light fringes and from the light fringes you can deduce whether or not there has something differently happened in the two different passes that's laser interferometry that's the technology we have been utilizing to measure gravitational waves so far atom interferometry is conceptually very similar However, now here, the active element is not laser light, but it's atoms. And it's not just one atom. It's actually a cloud of atoms, typically 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8 atoms, which are really cooled down to their ultra coldest possible state. So there's ultra cold uh, atoms. And then you're utilizing uh, laser light to act as a beam splitter. And what then happens is that you're basically separating this cloud of atoms, which is in the absolute ground state, into half of them being in an excited state and the other half of them remaining in the cloud state. And the excited state then travels through space and time, but still being in an entangled state. Now, that's where the entanglement comes in. So it's a true sense quantum sensor. And again, with laser light, you can establish the mirrors where you're turning back the excited state to the ground state and vice versa. And at the end of the day in your detection system, like for laser interferometry, you are observing matter fringes or atom fringes. Now, this atom fringes then will tell you whether or not something has happened to the phase of the atoms when it was traveling the two different passes. So that's conceptually the idea behind atom interferometry. Obviously, the technical implementation is much more challenging. Now, we have already seen at the beginning of this session quite nicely the comparison of utilizing instead of an atom interferometer atomic clocks to basically show how we would like to measure, for example, fundamental physics signals. So this is a, a slide I actually have chased, uh, stolen from Jason Hogan, as a matter of fact, which I really think makes it very nicely. So again, you have your ground state and your excited state of atoms. So this could, for example, be strontium atoms, as in our case, which are cooled down um, to the to the lowest possible temperatures. And then what you do is you use one. Um, laser beam to basically synchronize these two clocks. So you have to imagine that these two clocks are really separated far from each other in space time or in, in, in space, not in time, but in space. And that laser beam is synchronizing them. So with that laser beam, I basically um, split the atom sample, half of them in the excited state and half of them in basically in the ground state. Now I'm starting my experiment. So these clocks are now traveling. Wow, OK, there's a lot of a delay because of zoom in there. Now, traveling through space and time. And I'm again synchronizing my experiment. Now, what happens with the synchronization with one laser beam is because the excited state has traveled through space and time. And if you write down the, you know, the simple Lagrangian or Schrodinger equation for that, then you know that there has to be a phase to be accumulated at the excited state. Now, that phase. Um, if I compare the two clocks, will be basically related to the frequency difference of the excited and the ground state, in this particular case for single uh, photon transitions. And then if I compare the two clocks, I basically can do a null measurement because the same phase has been accumulated on clock one and on clock two. If I compare the two clocks in terms of time, I will get a null measurement. However, as already been shown also earlier, what happens if a gravitational wave would penetrate the space-time continuum of one of those clocks? And this is now obviously a conceptual simplification. But what would happen is because of the strain uh, this, this, this gravitational wave carries, there will be a length dilatation, which because of the speed of light and the, uh, uh, will translate and basically into a time dilatation, this atomic clock is going to see. And that time dilatation is basically being imprinted on that phase. Now, if I again make now the comparison between the two clocks, I can measure back delta T. And out of delta T, then I can basically deduce all the fundamental properties of the gravitational wave that has been there, frequency, and also its strain. That's the idea behind it. Now, as it happened to be, 
you can do exactly the same thing also for ultralight dark matter. As it has already been introduced, if you think of ultralight dark matter, like for example, as a Bose-Einstein condensate, so it will be described as a classical wave, which is basically penetrating us as we speak. And that classical wave now will introduce some changes to the fundamental constants of the atoms, for example, to the electron mass, but also to the alpha fine structure constant, which you can see as an imprint of an additional frequency on the separation of the ground state and the excited state. So this additional frequency that's been imprinted is basically coming and the property of the dark matter candidate you have, namely its mass. So there's a one-to-one -one relation between the two. Now that delta omega alpha, again, if there's a cloud penetrating this one atomic clock, will imprint on the phase, but this time not on the time, but actually really on the omega itself. So again, if I'm comparing back the two uh, uh, clocks, I will be able to measure that delta omega alpha and hence deduce the properties of the dark matter candidate which has been there. So that's the basic idea behind this. And it's interesting to say that with the same experimental setup, you can be sensitive to gravitational waves, but also to ultra light dark matter. So that's the basics behind it. Now, there's another very interesting thing for those who are having worked with laser interferometry. They know that in order to measure really gravitational waves, it is always important that you have this two arm structure because you basically compare two arms with each other in order to get rid of the laser noise that's been imprinted on your mirrors and everything. That's a fundamental principle of laser interferometry to reach this uh, precision level when it comes to gravitational waves. For atom interferometry, conceptually, you don't have to do this because the laser beam you're using or the laser pulse you're using will obviously have phase noise, mechanical platform noise, and so on. But because of quantum mechanics, you will imprint that on two clocks in the same, in the same way, exactly the same way. Again, it will separate and drop out in the uh, in the difference of your measurement. So that means that conceptually, and that could be an advantage to design the experiments, you don't need a double arm structure, but the single arm is fully sufficient to measure the properties you would like to do if you're utilizing atom interferometry. So that's one thing. Now, ion, and that's the experiment I'm going to talk to initially, is the experiment we have been establishing in the UK, as I will show you in a second, is really a different kind of an atom interferometer. So far, I've introduced to you this with clocks, but it really was meant to be atom interferometer because it has several uh, advantages, but more difficult to explain than the, the basics behind this. Now, if I want to build an atom interferometer on Earth, then I would like to ensure that I have sufficient amount of free fall time to interrogate the atoms. So basically, and that's been shown here in the space-time diagram, you can go to shafts. And that's been shown here. So there's different variations of shafts we have in mind. So for example, you can build a 10 meter tower as a prototype, then you can scale it to a 100 meter uh, detection system. And eventually we're planning to uh, build kilometer detectors uh, on Earth, which are having the capability, as I will show you in a minute, to measure gravitational waves. Now, the challenge will be that you really have to push the basic parameters of atom interferometry to a completely different level. And we are very much aware of it, that this really has to be pushed to uh, um, different parameters. And one of the most optimistic uh, scenarios we found is to really base uh, the atom species on strontium, the single photon transition on strontium. And the reason for that is that there has been a lot of development with atomic and optical clocks, which were based on strontium over the years. I mean, there were enormous improvements on the technology side with uh, atomic clocks. And we are benefiting from that improvement now to translate this over into um, uh, atom interferometry. But we are very much aware that we have to push the basic parameter space of atom interferometry for this particular species enormously. Now, for that reason, we have really built this four-stage program uh, in the UK. Uh, the first stage, which is to establish the technology and to basically um, build the expertise across the UK and to build a 10-meter prototype. That stage is now being funded with 10 million pounds. So it's currently ongoing over 30 months, but we're already actively planning for the second stage, namely to uh, put that technology into a 100 meter detector and to build that detector somewhere on European soil. There are several sites we are discussing of how this can be done, and this is actively uh, under, under consideration here. Stage three, this will be the ultimate kilometer scale for the terrestrial detector, as I will show you in a minute. This is then when you really go fully in the exploitation of gravitational waves in a new frequency band. But last but not least, and there's another thing we are actively working on, is to bring this to space, because that's the ultimate sensitivity you can reach when you bring this technology up in space, interrogation time, but also separation of these atom interferometer sequences will be uh, the advantage.
advantage. But you will have to go through the stage program before you really can put it into stage, uh, stage four, namely into space. But we have already submitted proposals to ESA and to NASA, who are currently under evaluation related to that for some pre-studies. So that's ongoing. Now, this is the ION collaboration. Um, just to point out, it's really is a big commitment in the UK. So these are the institutions which are involved in ION. So you can see here, there are all the big players in the UK. So there's Oxford University, there's Cambridge University, there's Imperial College, there's the Quantum Hub in, in Birmingham, there's Liverpool, and we also have a national lab named Liral being involved. And that's the collaboration we have here. Some people you might be familiar with for, in particle physics. So John Ellis is one of the funding members as well, like myself. But then there's also people like Ian Shipsey or Daniela who are coming out of the particle physics community. And as a matter of fact, that collaboration consists out of 50% particle physicists, i.e. those who want to do fundamental physics, and 50% on those who are the technology stakeholders, namely from cold, coming from cold atoms. So there's really a merger of two communities that's going to happen. And it's not only a one-way street, you know, that particle physicists are benefiting from quantum technology, but I would also like to show you that we from the particle physics community can bring something to the plate in order to improve the turnaround frequency for quantum technology development. So that is my first lesson we have learned after 18 months. So we're really now 18 months into the project with this 10 million being spent. And one of the big challenges we were facing was to build five ultra cold strontium laboratories across the country. And that was one of the, the things the funding agency was asking us, and many of the cold atom people were asking us and said, how can you build five state-of-the-art ultra-cold strontium laboratories in just 18 months? That was the challenge we were facing. And the answer to that was obviously not when we are pursuing the same technology development cold atom peoples are being used to. We have to employ, employ the methods we have been learning in particle physics in the large detector um, uh, production. And that means we have to do centralized design and production, and we have to go to proper management and use the resources we have at our national laboratories. So that was the way forward. And just to cut a long story short, and that was quite a successful way. It was initially a painful one because there's two cultural things coming together. One is like myself, being used to work in big teams uh, while cold atom people are just coming from the other way around. But eventually we managed and we started with a full centralized construction of our ultra high vacuum system, which is the core of such a cold atom experiment. And you can see here the different stages. So all institutions were being involved. Uh, we had centralized engineering efforts, uh, part coming from RAL, from our national labs, but also from Oxford and Imperial College. And this is then how these uh, ultra-cold vacuum systems looking like. Such an ultra-cold vacuum system with that complexity typically takes four to five years to be built in an inter inter uh, individual lab. That's what usually has to be done because there's many steps you have to do to really bring it to this, uh, uh, to this part. Now, with the centralized production, we were able to basically then build up this in 18 months. So that is one of the things. And we were building strontium labs in Birmingham, Cambridge, Imperial College, uh, Imperial College Oxford, and RAL. And these are pictures of old strontium labs as they are meant to look like eventually when they're being done. So these are really complex beasts you have to build up. And typically, as I said, it takes four to five years to have a fully functional lab, depending on the expertise you had. And we had to do five of them in 18 months. And just to show you that this is possible, so that was the first delivery of one of the side dumps, which were centralized, produced at Dasbury Laboratories, a national laboratory, to Cambridge. So that happened in July 2022. So the project started in May 2021. So that's uh, even less than 18 months. And this is then how such a system looks like. So this is really the three chamber uh, ultra high vacuum system in which you can do uh, all the strontium interferometry you would like to do. The next delivery then came, ooh, this is really slow, uh, to Birmingham in July 2022. You can already see the, the, the changes now. So the first one took us six months to build. The second one was being built in five to six weeks because all the expertise we learned in a centralized place. The third one then came in Imperial, um, at, um, which has a special, special feature, but I'm not going into this. This is really slow. Uh, in August 2022, so just a month later. And then we had basically 
Oxford delivery in October 2022 because there was the summer break, so some of the production didn't happen. Uh, and the last one then was being basically delivered in RAL also in October 22. So you can see five of those ultra high vacuum systems were being delivered basically in the time frame of you know a couple of months, some months. And not only this, because in parallel, we were also delivering laser stabilization system and optic system to these labs. So that means that basically shortly after the delivery, so they got the sidearm in July, July 2020, they saw the first 2D strontium mod, which is a real commissioning aspect then already in October 20. The next one then we have seen was uh, in, in, in Cambridge on the 26th of October. And then we had uh, um, uh, basically RAL following it. And Imperial and Oxford have slightly different focuses. They are going directly through the 3D mod, which will take another month longer. But that basically means it is possible now to build these labs in a time frame of a year. And that obviously is cutting timeline enormously. And that helps us to basically go to where we would like to go in terms of all the improvements we need to do. So five ultra cold strontium slabs were built in less than 18 months. And this is in large part because of what we know from the head production methods in which we are applying this to, uh, um, to this kind of uh, infrastructure. That will not only be important for that project, but we have lots of inquiry now coming from quantum computing systems because they're suffering from the same problems because at the end of the day, they all need laser stabilization systems. They all need ultra high vacuum systems to be built. And they would like to do that obviously in the most efficient and shortest time scale. So now there is a production line being set up. And that's also something we could offer to other countries if they have an interest in to participate and work with us, we can help with the building of those systems if there is any need for that. Now. Back to the landscape, um, iron and matches, we have already heard about iron and matches. By the way, iron and matches are direct partners. So we have directly partnered with the matches experiments in the US. We're making actually money contributions to matches itself. We are several institutions which are also in iron. So that is obviously one part of large scale up to interferometer prototyping, but there's much more ongoing as we speak now. So there is, for example, a hundred meter detection system. This is now not built horizontally, but it's built vertically with a two arm structure traditionally, but based on quantum sensors. Uh, and atom interferometer in France. Similar projects are happening in China, and there's a tower system also in Germany. Each of those, each of those five, are financed at the moment with 10 million currency units, and they're currently ongoing. So this means we have a global effort of around 50 to 60 million currency units invested in atom interferometry to be developed for fundamental physics exploitation. So these are all national you know, initiatives, not on an international ground yet, but national uh, uh, initiatives, which now need basically to be put together into a more international scheme to really understand how to move forward with all this prototyping and what the best way forward is. And this brings me to an advertisement. So with John Ellis and myself and many of the out of the cold atom community, we're organizing a terrestrial long baseline atom deformiger workshop at CERN. And that is really the idea to bring together all the stakeholders, fundamental physics stakeholders, but also cold atom stakeholders, whoever has an interest in this long baseline atom interferometry to discuss the options of where and how we could build large scale atom interferometers across the globe. And that is now starting to build a community effort that can basically go uh, along this. And I'm inviting you to have a look at this uh, workshop page. So the workshop will take place in March 13 and 14. And there's also re regist registration for those who would like to come to CERN, but there will also be an online uh, uh, option to join via Zoom eventually. So that is gonna come. Now, just to show you that CERN is not only being chosen just as a random place and it's a good place to come together, but CERN is also one of the potential sites of hosting a 100 meter atom interferometer detector that's been summarized here in this slide. Uh, we're working very closely with the physics bond collider team, but also with the quantum initiative to investigate what the options are. And there are other options in, the, in, the, uh, in Europe, like for example, the Bal Balby and Dasbury mines in, in which these things can happen as well. And and just to show you, if you look and compare, for example, with, uh, with NAL, where matches has been built, CERN sites for um, uh, basically, you know, uh, stochastic measurements and the seismic noise, they look very, very comparable. So these are all good places in which we could build these detection systems. Ideally, we would like to have two of them, if not even three across the globe. Um, and again, just to point out that even with a 100 meter detector, and that's already in a timescale of 2030-ish, what we are planning for, we could open up 
um, a first new frequency range for gravitational waves. So with the sensitivity I mentioned to you already, this shows you what LIGO and Virgo and advanced LIGO and Virgo eventually will be able to cover in that frequency range, but with a 100 meter detector either in the US or in Europe or even combined, that would be even better, you can open up a completely new frequency range as I will show you in a minute more. So a 100 meter detector by itself has already quite some interesting applications to gravitational wave physics and even more so to ultra light dark matter. So that brings me now to the real science motivations for these experiments. And 10 more minutes. Yeah, it's fine. Um, to the science uh, motivation. So it's the pathway to gravitational mid frequency. Um, and that basically shows you now that the frequency versus their characteristic strain of where we are basically today. Uh, if you look at that plot, you can see this is LIGO, what I showed you before. So there's a potential uh, um, you know, extension to LIGO, which we call Einstein Telescope, if it then has been realized. And obviously, LISA has been approved and is going to fly in 2013-5. Now, if you look at that plot, you can see that there is, as we would call it in London, mind the gap, a significant frequency gap in which we have no experimental solution at the moment to measure gravitational waves. And that has been the gap in which we have been pitching basically atom interferometry for, because because a kilometer detector uh, already, and that's been shown here, a kilometer detector, which we could have by 2035-ish, so it's similar timelines with LISA, could start filling in this uh, intermediate frequency range quite comprehensively. And that is already very interesting. Now, there's much more to this mid-frequency band than many people do appreciate. Um, one important aspect to it is that you know, all the signals you are basically observing in that mid-frequency range have typical lifetimes of days hours, days, weeks, or even months. So that's the frequency range you're covering. Now, if you think of LIGO and Virgo, they only see the last chirp of this black hole mergers. So it's a really, really short signal. So anything you would like to do in terms of multi-messenger physics is really a challenge. However, if you have a signal that lasts days, you can actually utilize the rotation of the Earth around the sun in order to make sky locations for example, of black hole mergers. And this has been shown here also by Jason Hogan, but also has been verified by our groups. For some of those signals, we would have got ideal sky locations. So if we would have had a mid-frequency detector instead of a, a, a high-frequency detector, then basically we could have already said weeks before that there's a signal coming, do your multi-messenger physics. That will be a major advantage of doing physics uh, in that mid-frequency range once we have these detection systems being put in place. And for that reason, we are really working very closely also on, a, you know, a tandem solution between ion and matches, as I pointed out to you already, with several of these uh, atom interferometers, which are actually operating in sync. That is one of the, the goals of the project, which we're currently setting up, synchronous operations between atom interferometers in the US and in, in, uh, in the UK. So that's going to come. Um, but ultimately, and this is that's what we have proposed to ESA, ultimately you want to bring this to space. And there's many reasons for that is, but the simplest one is interrogation time, because you know you have to have free fall. And in order to have infinite free fall, you have to go to space. Now, when you go to space, then obviously you can also push the distances between your atom interferometer sequences even much further, hence increasing the sensitivity enormously. So that has been submitted to ESA in the Voyage 2050 call, and it's currently still under evaluation as a, as a potential uh, uh, thing that might be flying in 2045 or even longer. So more than a decade after LISA, obviously. And that's then how such an experiment can look like in the mid-frequency range. So already a very simple experiment, basically based on that, can really cover completely in space the mid-frequency range. And then, and that's the ultimate scenario, which you can have, and this is, I'm talking here about 2045, for various different incarnations of space-based and ground-based experiments we could potentially build at that timeline. This could be the gravitational landscape plot you're looking right now. So if you compare this with the one we had before, there would be enormous progress forwards towards the, the, the full coverage of the frequency range. So that is obviously still more than a decade away. And I want to point out, this is not competition with LISA or Einstein Telescope. These experiments will happen before we will be able to do this uh, uh, exploitation with atom interferometry. So it's, if you like, the next generation after uh, laser interferometry, which we're planning here. Um, not to go too much into the details, uh, because I'm running out of time. Basically, just to point out that, obviously, it's not only about Astrophysics. I mean, black hole mergers is fascinating, it's interesting. We weren't going to learn a lot about it, but there's a lot of physics that must have happened at the beginning of the universe. 
um, which still has led to gravitational waves. And some examples we have been summarizing, one interesting one is the first phased order uh, transition. If you now look at these models and how gravitational waves they are producing, you see they look quite different than the ones we were showing before for the black hole mergers. And in order to separate such a signal from the one which from black hole merger, which would go like this, you will have to be able to measure over a very long distance in frequency, the signal itself. And that again is the argument of why you have to have full coverage of the frequency range, because only then we can separate signals coming from gravitational waves from cosmology background or from uh, uh, astrophysics background, if you like. Um, as another example, so there's another example here for cosmic streams, which again make the point that you really have to have full coverage in the frequency range. Um, there's much more information in a paper John Ellis and myself have been writing and others collaborators if you've been interested in. Very quickly to ultralight dark matter, because that's also fascinating and it's on the way to gravitational waves. So it's really in that frequency range. So this is a range I have been exploring for more than 20 years myself, uh, WIMPs in particular with other people like uh, Sven Heinemeyer and others. And now this is a new range we're looking into it. And um, it has already been pointed out that this is a huge parameter space, which is unexplored. Atom interferometry can take some part of it, but clearly not all of it, and it will have to be a comprehensive program to cover this completely. And just to point out, we mentioned this already, this is classical waves, basically, and uh, let me go straight to the, to the limits, just to show you that in this parameter space, again, the sequence of different experiments we could set up over the next two decades, um, like the terrestrial experiments, but also some of the kilometer scales and space-based experiments will really be able to probe, you know, really orders and orders of magnitude of this parameter space as we go along. So it's a really interesting program we are having here. And I only were touching on um, basically, you know, gravitational waves and ultralight dark matter, because these are the two main drivers we are developing. There's a lot of other interesting science you could do potentially with these atom interferometers once you have built them with that level of sensitivity. A very interesting one is namely now looking at probing dark energy, in particular placing limits on, uh, uh, on the gravity mass. So that is an active research we are building up right now, and we would like to make that case as a third leg of the physics case, if you like, in a, in a year's time from now. That is very encouraging things you could do with atom interferometer also when it comes to not only probing dark matter but also dark energy. So it's a really exciting new research avenue ahead of us. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it here. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks a lot. Okay, the questions. Yeah. Hi, very interesting. Um, I have two questions. First about, uh, you said uh, you can determine the location already beforehand and then tell the other instruments where to look at. But is it really sufficient with two? Because I think uh, with LIGO Virgo, only once they got three, they could really pinpoint something. Um, obviously, it will be better to have two on Earth, but that is not where the sensitivity comes from. The sensitivity really comes from basically the rotation of the detection system, it could be one or two of Earth around the sun. Because the signal you are measuring is not just a chirp, it's really something that goes over weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay. while you go around, you can basically make sky location with the, with the sun. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on page 32, where you are showing this uh, physics example, the uh, mass scale lambda that could be accessed by your experiment, by the various experiments, actually, it's very slow. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <it's>, uh... <laughs> I suffered the same. Um, and I was wondering why the improvement is so low. I mean, you go really from short to large experiments. And one more. It's the same here, I think, but okay. Okay, yeah, for this lambda scale. Yeah, mm. I mean, the, the improvement is, is really... Uh, 10% or something like that. And I was wondering, why is it so bad? The scale here on lambda here? Uh, yes, I'm also in the left and left or right. Well, that's I, well, that's, I, I probably I, is the better summary because that shows yeah. you, you know, that the limit you can really I'm play. I'm surprised that, I mean, 700 is then completely out of reach for all our foreseeable future. And uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a model. Like John would be better, but he's another meeting now. But John would be better to explain that uh, because uh, uh, he has done that with his with his student. Um, I don't know how this exactly this lambda translates then uh, basically later to, to 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 the other mass scales. But yeah, that's basically what comes when you have that particular imp implementation of a very simplified first order. Uh, there's several more in the paper I was pointing you to. Um, have a look in there. But yeah, ask John why okay. why it's only no, such a small problem. Thanks. And there are many people written not just john the other papers on that too but uh, we have two two, two questions uh, so vivek is okay one, and then there is sadik is there? okay who uh, my question relates oh, to the astrophysical neutrinos are you talking about the relic neutrinos the big bang neutrinos and how uh, the interaction would change i mean how with the let's say the earth going in one direction and then six months later going in the other direction what Neutrinos I only had and uh, mentioned in the in the fundamental physics shopping list. If that's what you are referring to. So what I'm talking about is actually gravitational waves that were created at the beginning of the universe. Okay. So for example, you know, after ten to the minus ten seconds is where you were having basically an you know many many Higgs incarnations being produced. These were leading to gravitational waves of very characteristic uh, properties. And these are still you know, going around. And if you be able to measure them, uh, you, you are actually able to deduce the underlying quantities that must have happened at the beginning of the universe. So that's the idea. You're using mm -hmm. gravitational waves as a memory imprint of that physics that has happened there, and you analyze it later. So it's not directly neutrinos. It's it's uh, some neutrinos at all. It's, it's just a gravitational wave. It's the wave itself that was created um, with that particular phase order transition or anything else that has happened. All, there. all those physics leads to tensor perturbations of space time, which creates space time, and that's what he's talking. About. And all these gravitational waves are still there. We just need to be able to be sensitivity enough to measure them. So it's a direct measurement of metric fluctuation, not to light or polarization or neutrinos. Okay, Sadiq had the last question. Then. So um, this is kind of question in two parts. Uh, one is uh, the characteristic strain that you have with you, with at these frequencies, which are essentially uh, longer time measurements, that is smaller than the what what LIGO supports. And uh, the uh, so is that competitive? A and the other thing is that. Um, if you have a longer time over which you have to integrate your signal, uh, you will have a lot of confusion from different signals which will pile on. So how do you intend to resolve that? What is the science case for that? Okay, F first question first. So you, you might have realized that I switched scale. I had not enough time to explain this because before I showed you strain sensitivity as a function of frequency. And now I move to another quantity, which is basically a dimensional quantity, it's the energy density of a gravitational wave. The problem with the strain is, depending on the, and the sense, it may look like that an experiment is actually not so sensitive. Um, LISA is even worse than the mid-frequency, but it's just a property of the density of the gravitational wave, energy density you're measuring. So if you look here, actually, LISA is better in the peak sensitivity than Einstein telescope. Because that's the real quantity you are measuring. You're measuring the energy density of a gravitational wave. The strain is simply a translation into it and later. And you just get a larger strain at higher frequencies than you get at lower frequencies for the same energy density. Energy density is a much better way to compare, in my opinion. But then we can argue with the gravitational wave people because this is historical. So I'm not going to do that. But from a physics perspective, that's a better way to do. Second, you are absolutely right. So once we are building experiments like LISA in particular, because that will be exposed to that, you will measure, hopefully, you know, a real magnitude of different gravitational waves happening all at the same time. And we will have to establish the analysis techniques to basically filter them out individually. Now, LISA has huge working groups currently working on that because it's even more important for them than it is in the mid-frequency uh, because as higher you go, basically, as more of those signals you're basically getting, yeah? Uh, so that's what LISA is doing. And at the moment, we are parasitically hoping to benefit from whatever LISA is basically developing. So we are aware of it, but we have not the bandwidth right now to build up our own analysis team. But LISA has a lot of people working on that. Okay, let's thank the speaker and uh, wonderful talk, Oliver. Thank, thank you. you.